for starting this meeting, I will uh, share my screen to um, be able to give a short introduction on the on the topic. I hope you can see my screen now. Can you? Yes. Excellent. Okay. So this is indeed about nourishing the post-COVID-19 world. So it's not just about building back better, but nourishing the world. And we, you may recall that earlier, before the summer, there was also a thematic session of this particular group that addressed nutrition. So some of the messages we, we will take again and we will build on them. Um, we will nourish them, as to say, uh, and go a little bit more in depth. The thematic working group on nutrition in the IETF has uh, worked together to um, uh, write a joint narrative advocating for the importance of, of nutrition in the uh, pandemic we are living in. So just to recap is that um, currently, according to the WHO data, we have about 48 million cases of COVID-19 and over 1.2 million deaths. Um, but despite that, we need to acknowledge and we need to recognize that malnutrition and diet-related illnesses remain the leading cause of ill health and premature mortality. But when you combine the two, when you look at the impact of malnutrition on COVID-19, you can see that overweight and obesity are associated with greater severity of symptoms and poorer outcomes. So this comorbidity is really, really an important factor when we look at COVID-19. What we also see, malnutrition negatively impacts on the immune system functioning. So these are things we, that were discussed also before the summer in the nutrition section. But also we have now looked more carefully uh, to the broader food system and how that impacts on um, through COVID-19 on malnutrition. We see disrupted food systems worsening the access to nutritious, particularly nutritious foods. We see disrupted health systems, reducing access to essential nutrition services, and we see undermining healthy dietary practices and caregiver behaviors. So COVID is really aggravating an already serious situation. There is a risk that an additional 130 million people are facing uh, acute food insecurity. We also see the risk of 6.2 million additional cases of childhood uh, wasting. And not the least is that these impacts are not distributed equally. We see an intensification of, of inequality. And these are all elements we have been addressing in our joint narrative that is available on the website, the UNSCN website, but also on the IETF website. And I just want to recall a few of, um, of the action and messages from that um, narrative before we go in depth through our several speakers. A quote from our UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, he says, unless immediate action is taken, it, it, it is increasingly clear that there is an impending global food crisis that could have long-term impacts on hundreds of millions of children and adults. But we can do something about it. As said, COVID-19 poses new and unprecedented challenges, but the solutions are there uh, to prevent this threat. And the solutions are not new. And the solutions, in fact, are already described and supported by action plans in the context of the nutrition decade that runs from 2016 to 2025. So we are right in the middle of it, as well as the 2030 agenda. Also important to note, because we also are looking at an aggravating situation when you look at inequality, we need more attention that for actions that should be based on effective rule of law, good governance and respect for human rights. So that will also be addressed this afternoon. So just to become a little bit more concrete, I'm not going to read out all the uh, uh, measures, um, just, just a few, like we need to look at food and nutrition services as essential to prevent disruptions to the food supply. We need also advocating for the continuation of local markets. We say often that 
our supply lines are too long. Let's look at shorter lines. Um, so look at local market shops and stores and secured supply chains to support availability of reasonably priced fresh foods and essential staples. Fresh, nutritious food often is a problem in this emergency. Also looking at marketing and the promotion or, or mass distribution of highly processed foods that are high in saturated fats, free sugar, and are sold to children and families in the context of emergency response. So these are immediate measures that need to be put in place. But we also need to look at the longer term. But longer term measures require immediate action as well. So just the second one I'd like to highlight here. We need to look at strengthening double duty actions that address both undernutrition and overweight and obesity. And I'll stop just a few seconds. So you can, you can look at that infographic of the double burden of malnutrition and then the double duty actions that are needed to address the double burden. And this afternoon, we will have a few speakers that are in fact going to speak about breastfeeding as one of the double duty actions, school food policies and programs, and also regulations. So that's really, really encouraging that we as UN family are already on track on addressing these immediate measures and looking at longer term measures. But we are also going to look at um, food systems in the broader sense. And we are going to ask ourselves if, if our group, the UN IETF, does have a role in the food system that is going to take place uh, next year, September, um, as called by the Secretary General. So we will have five speakers this afternoon. We will start with Jamie Morrison from FAO. Uh, who will say something about the Food System Summit and Food System Transformation. Then we will go to UNICEF, Ms. Fatmata Sesai, who will look at specifically at breastfeeding and young, and young infant child feeding. We will go to WFP, School Food and Nutrition Actions, move on to IDLO, Julia Zefi, and then we, um, uh, we close the line with, we close the role with WHO Melina Cohen, who will look at a review of COVID-19 preparedness and response plans through an NCD lens. So I'm happy. This is really going to be a very good set of speakers, and I'm looking forward to listening to all of you. So, Jamie, the floor is yours. Over to you. Thank you, um, Stineke, and, and hello to everybody. So as, as Sinica said, I'll, I'll speak about the Food System Summit. And while it's difficult to do this in five minutes to really give it justice, I'll try to touch on some of the key opportunities for pushing forward actions on nutrition and on NCDs. And I appreciate that each of you will have different levels of knowledge about the Food System Summit. Uh, so apologies in advance if I provide too much detail for some. Um, I see Lena, for example, on the call, who's very much involved, but on the other hand, too little for others, but I'm happy to, to take questions um, or provide additional information afterwards. So just to start on, on why the summit, and I think there were two key reasons behind the push um, from the summit, which came originally from the, the RBAs. First was the recognition that, that whilst food system transformation has been identified as one of the few entry points for accelerating progress towards the SDGs, food systems have been underperforming. So that, that was the sort of obvious reason. But perhaps less obvious was that while many food system stakeholders have been making changes to the sustainability of food systems, they, their many initiatives have tended to be independent of one another and have not really recognized the complex interrelationships dependencies and trade-offs which are intrinsic within food systems. Uh, to give a few examples, producers have, been, have long been experimenting with alternative production technologies, not just to limit their impacts on, on biodiversity, natural resources and climate, but also to look at how they can produce food for markets which are demanding more um, nutritious or more, more healthy um, or looking, looking towards more healthy diets. At the same time, food industry has been engaging in more sustainable sourcing, product reformulation, efforts to reduce loss throughout the value chain. 
Consumers have been seeking out better information about safe food for healthier diets, advocating for more environmentally friendly food products, and also making efforts to, to reduce and to better handle the waste that they're generating from their consumption of food. And as we all know, other public agencies have been attempting to strengthen various aspects of food systems, whether it's food control systems, or bringing in regulations around the way that food is produced, um, processed, distributed, and eventually consumed. But I think what we found was that there is a sense that there is a, a lack of alignment between many of these initiatives. And this has re really constrained our ability as societies to move forward with very different priorities that different societies hold, um, whilst observing different socioeconomic trends whether they be in terms of, of um, public health, whether they be in terms of economic development, the fact that countries have very different agroecological potentials and also very different institutional setups, which can prevent some countries from taking actions which would move them towards a more sustainable um, setting. So we really see that the summit is providing a potentially transformative moment that can be used to generate greater alignment of action. The summit itself will try to achieve four main outcomes. Firstly, dramatically elevating public discourse on the importance of food systems for achieving all elements of sustainable development. I think, yeah, we often talk amongst ourselves as if everybody in the public understands the relationship between food um, and health, food and the environment, food and climate, food and livelihoods. The fact is that there's a fairly limited understanding um, of these relationships. So the summit itself will, will provide that opportunity for elevating our understanding of the importance of moving towards more sustainable food systems. Uh, for many of us, the most important outcome will be the identification and operate, operationalization of a set of game-changing solutions. So actions which either foster greater alignment within the current rules of the game, or which look at changing the rules within which food system actors operate. You know, one example of that may be looking at repurposing agricultural subsidies, for example, um, to allow a shift in the way in which different types of food are produced, but also in the ability of, of consumers to actually access and, and to afford that food. So that, that would be a sort of game-changing solution. Because it's a summit, there will of course be a document coming out of it. That's the third outcome. There will be an outcome document. It won't be a negotiated document, but it will be a, a high level set of principles which different constituencies hopefully will sign up to and which will help to put us on a path um, towards transformation in um, the majority of countries. And a fourth outcome, importantly, is a, a system of follow-up and review. And this is not just simply a, a, a sort of list of commitments which is ticked off um, and followed up on or not, but actually a process which allows the pathway towards more sustainable food systems to, to unfold. We, we know that whatever solutions are developed by the summit, some of them will work, some of them won't but many will need adjustment along the way. So you need that sort of system of monitoring and, and follow up afterwards. So in order to achieve the outcomes, there's a, an intensive preparatory process that's been put in place that will include a pre-summit event, which will take place in Rome, probably next July, um, date yet to be fixed. And then the summit itself, which will take place in New York during UNGA next September. And I can't go into all details on the elements of the, of the structure and process, but let me just say a few words about two of the main components, which will allow for the involvement of all food um, system constituencies. These are the action tracks on the one hand and a set of food system dialogues on the other. The action tracks, there are five of them. They're structured around the, the key objectives of the summit in terms of what we would like to see change. Um, action track one, for example, on ensuring access to safe and nutritious food for all. Action track two, shifting towards more sustainable consumption patterns. 
a third one on boosting nature positive production, a fourth on improving livelihoods, and a fifth on increasing resilience to food systems. Now, the idea is that these action tracks won't work in isolation of themselves, that there will be a, a close integration across the tracks and hopefully a convergence as we move towards the summit. But clearly action track one and action track two, um, there is significant potential for putting a greater emphasis on some of the, the, um, the actions that Stineker has, has outlined at the beginning. So thinking through how we introduce some of that thinking into the work of the first action track. Action track one will have work streams on zero hunger, access to nutritious diets, and on safe food. So there are clear entry points there that we can try to work through. Action track two, which uh, Lena is involved with from, from WHO, has two action tracks which are, are directly related to um, nutrition and NCDs, one on the food environment and another on boosting demand for healthy diets. There is also another work stream on, on circularity. The action tracks are, are, are what will be used to generate these game-changing solutions. Um, but as I said, we, we, we need to do this in a way which is integrated across the five tracks. So we're not just looking at achieving one outcome. We're, we're not trying to push the transformation of food systems just to deliver healthier or more affordable healthy diets. We're trying to do that at the same time as ensuring that the food produced for consumption is produced in a sustainable way, but it's also produced in a way which generates jobs and livelihoods for still a large majority of, of the population in, in rural areas, but increasingly in urban areas who are associated with, with food systems. Let me finish just with a couple of words on, on the food system dialogues, the other components. The idea of the dialogues is to ensure that we get real inclusion in the discussion towards the summit. Now, the action tracks will be a fairly limited um, number of people that can actually engage with the work of the action tracks. The food system dialogues, by taking it down to the level of the country and also sub-national level, provide a platform for a much wider um, or much larger number of, of individuals and organizations to become involved. There will be three types of dialogues. The first, which will take place at at global events. For example, towards the end of, um, of November, we have the, the third global conference of the One Planet Network Sustainable Food System Program. That will have a global dialogue embedded within it. And, and many of us are involved um, or associated with that, that particular program. There will also be a series of member state led dialogues. The idea is to have a set of three dialogues in every country, every UN member country, so OECD and non-OECD. And this will help countries move towards a roadmap which will allow them to implement solutions post-summit. And there will be a lot of in interaction and iteration between the action tracks which are generating these sort of solutions and the, uh, and the dialogues where we can get some sort of ground truthing and feedback on those solutions. And then the third type of dialogue, importantly, is the independent dialogue, which a methodology has been provided in any constituency globally, whether that be a, a community such as the one sitting around um, this particular group, uh, or it could be a, a municipality, or it could be an a group of indigenous peoples can hold these dialogues and providing they, they follow some fairly basic principles can then feed that the outcomes of that dialogue back into the, the, um, the process of the summit. And again, I think there's an opportunity for a group such as this because although the, the member, member state dialogues will be convened by the government, they've been asked to appoint a national convener, there will be a heavy reliance on the UN country teams to support the process. So again, through our organizations, we have a, an opportunity here to ensure that nutrition issues around NCDs and related issues are part of that dialogue. So remain a priority within the thinking of the country that they're sort of not dropped off the agenda or given less, less priority. 
So I think, yeah, let, let me leave it at that, Spinnaker. There's a lot more, obviously, that can be said about the summit, but I think that's, that's probably enough for now. Yes, thanks uh, a lot, Jamie. And uh, I think it's been very clear that working from producer to consumers, what do producer organizations say and consumer organizations? I, th I think it's so essential that we get these groups together and not looking at them individually. I, I just want to highlight again what you said about the game changing solutions. Uh, I, when I introduced the topic for today, I spoke about double duty actions. So I believe that this nutrition group may want to get some of the double duty actions as a game changing solution. I wouldn't be surprised. So let's let's work together and see how we can um, make that happen. Um, I did a terrible job introducing you. I said, you're Jamie from FAO, you are, but you are also director of the food system and food safety division. And I know you have to leave at 4.30, um, but before you go, I just noticed a question in the chat from Miriam from the World Bank. Um, she asks, can you please say a few words about the difference? Well, she asked to me, but I'm asking you. Uh, if you can say a few words about the difference between urban and rural areas where it comes to the impact of COVID-19 on food systems and food security. I'm, I'm sure you, I, I, you are, I am aware that you did a bit of research about it last year, so maybe you can take like one minute to try and answer that question before you have to move on. Okay, let, let me try. And I think that the um, research that you were referring to was that actually took place this year. It was a, a reaction to um, the COVID pandemic. And what we did was to survey um, officials from mun municipalities around the world as to what impacts they were seeing in urban areas and what sort of response measures that they were putting in place. And I think from memory, we had responses from about 77 different countries covering, I can't remember exactly, but over a hundred cities of, of various sizes. So if you look on the FO website, you can find the results of that survey, but yeah, so some quite interesting differences across different size cities, but also across regions, obviously. Um, most, the majority of, of um, cities in more resource constrained countries did not receive any additional funding to cope with the effects of the pandemic. And when I say the effects, I mean the, the significant disruption to um, food markets, both formal and informal within urban areas in, in um, many non-OECD countries. Um, the closing of, of um, open markets in some instances for, for certain periods of time, the difficulty of labour um, to be engaged in the distribution of food, th these sort of aspects had to, had to be um, handled without additional resources. And the response was actually quite significant and demonstrated the, the, the ability of municipalities and local government to take this role. Uh, responses through, for example, um, scaling up of, of um, school feeding or using other distri distribution um, mechanisms, putting in place price and, and supply monitoring. So I think, yeah, we, we saw quite visibly some of the weaknesses in urban food systems. Um, yeah, the fact that you have the disconnect between the, the producers and consumers is much greater. Um, and that was reflected also in, in results coming from the smaller um, towns and cities where the impacts were much less visible because you already had that connection between um, between the sort of the, the rural and the urban area, the linkages being a lot stronger uh, in those localities. So I don't know, that doesn't really specifically answer the question. I mean, obviously there are clear differences between urban and, and um, rural areas. And it, it tends to be really to do, to do mainly with the, the sort of um, dislocation of consumption and production um, and the sort of weaknesses we see in the chain linking the two. Yes, thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Jamie. I, I agree with you that we can say so much more, but what I really want to highlight from your answer is that we also look, have to look at 
local governance and localities and the spatial dimension of, of this issue, food security and nutrition and the responses to COVID-19. Um, let's, let's park this issue. It, it may be even a topic for, for a full afternoon or a full one hour session because we can say so much more about it. Maybe, maybe that could be an idea, uh, Nick or uh, Giuseppe, to take that on. Um, so thank you very much, Jamie. I would like now to go to our next speaker from uh, UNICEF. Uh, Fatima, you have the, uh, sorry, <laughs> Fatmata, you have the floor. Thank you so much. I would just like to project a few slides uh, to take us through. Mm -hmm. uh, can you all see my slides? Yes. Okay, great. So basically, I'll be talk taking you through the impact of COVID-19, uh, not just on breastfeeding, but uh, generally on infant and young child feeding. Uh, this also covers uh, complementary feeding and uh, its long-term consequences uh, for the NCD burden. So for today's presentation, I will seek uh, to answer a few questions, uh, basically around uh, why breastfeeding is important uh, during uh, this COVID-19 pandemic, and uh, how the pandemic has affected breastfeeding and complementary feeding, and uh, also we'll look at what are the potential impact of uh, COVID-19 on the NCD burden, and then we'll follow it up with a quick uh, call to action. So my name is Fatma Fatima Sisse, nutrition specialist uh, with UNICEF. So looking at uh, the context uh, that we are in presently, uh, we know that optimal breastfeeding uh, practices remain critical because we know that uh, optimal breastfeeding practices have an impact on economic health, survival, and with long-term benefits in reducing the burden on NCDs. Uh, the numbers are clear here. Uh, it's very clear that uh, breastfeeding to the recommended uh, levels will prevent at least 820,000 deaths annually and will also reduce the risks of overweight, obesity and diabetes and also could save the economy with about 300,000 billion in healthcare costs annually. And we do know that infants who are exclusively breastfed are 14 times, who are not exclusively breastfed, are 14 times more likely to die than those who are exclusively breastfed. This is a compelling um, evidence uh, to just show the context and the importance of breastfeeding uh, in, the, in this current pandemic. And to follow up with that, we also know that complementary feeding is the critical window to prevent all forms of childhood malnutrition, including uh, NCDs, obesity, overweight. And uh, we recognize the important role of complementary feeding to child survival, growth and development, as well as micronutrient deficiencies and the lifelong preferences on taste habits, you know, are established during this period. And we clearly know that for young children and their caregivers, during this pandemic, they are increasingly, increasingly exposed to foods of low nutritional value. Uh, the first speaker you know, has already alluded to this point, but emphasizing that the commercial complementary foods and the processed foods high in added sugar, salt, and saturated trans fat, uh, trans fat you know, is worsening the situation for COVID-19 especially for, for uh, young children. And it's very clear that the, imp uh, the pandemic has impacted breastfeeding and complementary feeding practices. The health systems are overburdened. A lot of research, you know, has cited this recently. UNICEF did, you know, research in over 88 countries across the world. And it's very clear that overburdened health systems are impacting uh, breastfeeding and complementary feeding practices. Because systems are dealing with COVID, 
with limitations in the provision and use of health services. And there are disruptions as well. Then there are also limitations in the availability of skilled health workers and increased reluctance by women to uh, use health services, basically receiving IYCF uh, 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 services due to fears of uh, in, uh, infection while seeking uh, services. So we have seen basically a low coverage at facility uh, uh, and community level in terms of uh, collective IYCF practices. Then there are a lot of misconceptions around breastfeeding, the fears, like do I breastfeed if I'm positive? What do I do? Do I need to separate my, my uh, if I just delivered? Do we have to separate a mother and a baby? All of this, you know, accumulated in terms of, uh, you know, the impact of COVID-19 on breastfeeding. And importantly, we have also seen the formula manufacturers, you know, of BMS exploiting the fears of COVID-19 by mothers through the coercive marketing practices in violation of the international code of breast milk substitute. And, you know, as many other studies have also highlighted, there is limited access to fresh foods, families resource to cheaper accessible processed foods, you know, which has, you know, longer term impact. On, on health for children as well as uh, through adulthood. Then uh, recently within UNICEF, uh, a report that uh, it's an internal report, we have seen that about 52 countries, you know, have already uh, reported disruptions in interventions that promote uh, breastfeeding as well as nutritious and safe diets for infants. And the recent model uh, has estimated that there would be a severe reduction, if there is a severe reduction in breastfeeding, this could lead up to almost 140,000 deaths across 129 low and middle income countries over a period of one year plus additional mobility. This calls for concern and the impact is huge, but we also know that, no doubt, the impact of the pandemic on early life has long-term consequences for the NCD body, simply because we know that breastfeeding could avert nearly 100,000 uh, cases of childhood obesity, and breastfeeding and complementary feeding have protective effect on overweight and type two diabetes in children and adolescents, as well as the protect, as, as well as uh, breastfeeding having at least, you know, 26% reduction in overweight and obesity during adulthood. So these are all of the gains we may stand to lose if we do not take action. So uh, in terms of uh, where we are on breastfeeding and complementary feeding, even though globally, uh, some of the indicators we have not met on breastfeeding and complementary feeding. We know that we have made significant progress in improving the coverage of IYCF, mainly breastfeeding over the past decade. And we know that COVID-19 is posing a severe threat, you know, in reversing this positive trajectory on breastfeeding if we do not take any action. So with UNICEF, we have called we have urged governments, policymakers, and partners to support breastfeeding and complementary feeding in the, in the context of COVID-19. And there are a lot of actions that we have taken as an institution, as an agency, to ensure that we mitigate this impact. Uh, one of this is we have developed and disseminated accurate information uh, to beauty bearers to ensure that uh, the misconceptions around COVID-19 and breastfeeding are averted. And the monitoring of the code on, uh, of the international code on marketing of breast milk substitutes and reporting on, on violations, we continue to strengthen our efforts, our supporting this, strengthening this uh, in countries to ensure that this is maintained and we do not fall back on this during the pandemic. 
And we continue to advocate and strengthen the capacities of service providers in providing skill counseling for a collective IYCF package because this is a critical intervention in the pandemic, especially when mothers have misconceptions, fears about accessing services, and even fears about breastfeeding. I mean, this is an important intervention uh, we continue to deliver. And we have also continued to strengthen our research and monitoring of IYCF practices during COVID. We recently conducted you know, a large scale uh, survey on uh, the adoption of breastfeeding recommendations in the context of COVID-19 across 88 countries. And the results, you know, have really given us an indication of where countries are in the implementation of this uh, recommendations and areas where we need to further support and strengthen um, breastfeeding and complementary feedings, feeding across the countries. And we are also advocating for the increased investment to breastfeeding you know, in the context of COVID, you know, around the umbrella of the Breastfeeding Collective, this is also an action that UNICEF and all other partners, the BHU that support the collective are pushing towards to ensure that we have collective action to support increased investment to breastfeeding. And also advocating that we strengthen the social protection programs to ensure that, you know, di diets for children are diverse and are also healthy. So with that, uh, I would like to say thank you. And that's it for me, over. Thank you so much, uh, Fatmata Fatima. I think this is really powerful, what you just said. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what, how to highlight the, the most important part, but, but there seemed in the past a little bit of positive progress, but we have to run so much faster if we want to maintain and keep up and promote further good breastfeeding practices and complementary feeding, it's so important. As we started off saying, this is one of the most important double duty actions. We cannot stop promoting that. So I will stop here. I would like to hand over to WFP, to Marie, to move on. We, we are following more or less the life cycle. We are from young, uh, young children, we are now going to school age children. But before um, asking, uh, giving you the floor, Marie, I, I, I am being a very bad chair and I know for sure we are going to take a little bit more time than, uh, than stopping, being able to stop exactly at 5 p.m. So I hope you will bear with us. I think we need uh, maybe 10 minutes more. So I think it's too interesting to stop uh, the speaker exactly after five minutes. I simply didn't want to. So Marie, you have five minutes, but I think I will allow you a little bit more if you run over time, because it's simply too much information to share within the five minutes. Sure, thanks, Tineke, um, and I'll try and keep it as much as possible to five minutes. Uh, good afternoon to everyone, um, good morning to those joining from New York. Um, I'll just share my screen. So I'm assuming you're seeing my slides. Yes, we can. Okay, great. Okay, so um, thanks for the introduction and I'll be providing um, a short overview on some of the impact and the actions um, that WFP in collaboration with other agencies on the call today um, have been doing to mitigate uh, the effects of COVID-19 on school aged children. I'll start off first um, with just highlighting why it's important to invest in, um, in a school aged child. So following on um, very nicely from what um, uh, Fatmata has just said about the importance of the first 1000 days, we of course acknowledge this as essential. Of course, we know that during this period, brain growth and development occurs, and of course, intrauterine growth and development. Marie, if I may interrupt you, we can also read your notes. So I don't know if you want to set your slide to uh, the slideshow option. Yeah, I was trying to figure out how to do that actually, because I'm using- Yeah, now we have it on full screen. Oh, okay. thank you. I don't know what I did, but okay, great. So <laughs> thanks for that. So um, yeah, so as I was saying, um, why do we care as WFP on these next 7,000 days? So we know that during this period um, that catch-up growth and sustained growth occurs. 
and growth actually can falter with age. So it's important to promote uh, the healthy growth across the development years and obviously make investments in school aged children. So, and this builds on, on the investments made in the first 1000 days. So we know that school aged children are of course still being affected by infectious diseases, undernutrition and micronutrient deficiencies, and now more recently overweight and obesity. So just a couple of key facts before I go into the effects uh, of COVID on children is we know that an undernourished mother will give birth, more likely to give birth to an underweight child. And that's associated with a higher risk of overweight and obesity and NCDs later in life. But we also know that children that are born to an overweight mother is more likely to develop obesity as they mature. Um, and also of course, a diet related NCDs. So, in city. so this relationship highlights the importance of this period um, uh, to invest in and provide this enabling environment to mitigate the effects and break this intergenerational cycle um, and, uh, of poor nutrition. So during COVID, we saw that um, obviously learning with schools being closed was significantly impacted. Um, and also being significantly impacted is the likelihood of the continuation and return to education. So during the peak of the crisis, there was almost 1.6 billion children that were out of school because of school closures. And now we've, uh, we know that between 16 and 24 million students um, are at risk of not returning to education this year and in 2021, and with 7.6 of those, uh, million of those being girls. There's obviously been a disruption of access to essential services that pose a threat to child health and survival. And the remote working of schools and online learning is great that we have this option, but not everybody has this option with many children not having access to the internet. We've seen that more households have been pushed into this multi-dimensional poverty. And of course, food security has been impacted with children missing out on school meals unless alternatives to school meals are identified. So this is a snapshot of the peak of the crisis. So in April, we saw that 199 schools were closed with almost 370 million children missing out on school feeding. So this is a map um, established by WFP and I'll show you in a moment an updated map where we are at the moment. So during this period, WFP stepped up its work with partners, uh, including FAO and UNICEF to issue um, a, a series of guidance um, for governments for where schools were closed and for where schools uh, remained open. The source is at the bottom, so I'm not gonna go through the specific actions, um, but just to say that now that schools have started to reopen, WFP together with UNESCO and UNICEF and the World Bank um, launched a framework to inform decision-making um, to help national preparedness plans on, on returning children back to school. Um, during the crisis, one of the main things that WFP um, did do was support um, schools in their school feeding programs by, by providing take-home rations and vouchers, and WFP continues to do that in schools that remain closed. So this is where we are at the moment. So obviously the number has significantly decreased down um, to now 90 countries with school closures um, from 199 but 260 million children are still missing out on their school meals globally. So um, as mentioned previously, WFP is working to ensure that children receive their school meals at home, um, or when that is not possible, then cash-based transfers or vouchers um, to ensure that that meal is, um, is being provided. Um, just quickly to mention one of the main partnerships is with UNICEF um, on ensuring children um, do receive um, not only a school meal, but essential um, other services such as nutrition education and WASH. So again, I won't go through the details of the partnership, um, but just to say that there are 30 countries that are the focus at the moment, um, particularly in fragile contexts, with 10 million children being, um, being, being the focus of that partnership there. As schools have started to reopen now, we've, um, we're starting to learn a lot more about what's working and what's not. Um, and a report recently published by UNICEF together with the World Bank, WFP, UNHCR and UNESCO um, was just released uh, in September about sharing lessons um, to strengthen countries' response plans um, to reopen schools. 
So um, improving the practice um, and separating these learnings into four key areas, including safe operations, um, the focus on learning, uh, well-being and protection, um, and reaching, of course, the most uh, vulnerable and marginalised, including girls. So just to close off, um, just a couple of key messages. So of course, there are still schools um, that remain closed and we need to remain flexible as the situation uh, continues to evolve. So schools may be open now, but depending on the transmission of the virus, we might see that in a couple of months, schools may start to close again. We just don't know. So it's important that um, we are flexible in the planning and WFP is supporting national governments in this. Um, and ensuring this regular and safe delivery of essential services. Where schools have remained closed, um, we continue to adapt the programs, particularly with alternatives to school meals. We, of course, use this opportunity to support program linkages and integrating nutrition. And we've really seen that during the COVID-19 pandemic, the importance of functioning food system and the importance of good health and nutrition. So we're really using this as an opportunity to scale up our efforts. And of course, we continue to advocate and collect age specific um, uh, research and data to ensure that we actually know what school children are consuming, what their weight status is, for example, and their growth trajectory um, to ensure that funds are appropriately allocated. So I'll end there. Um, thank you for listening um, and look forward to hearing from the other speakers. Thanks, Dimike. Thanks so much, uh, Marie. And I, I really appreciated your presentation. Uh, you really started by saying, okay, this is the problem. This is where we see an aggravation of the problem. So many million children of, of, of losing out, being the worst victims, which we in fact also saw in the presentation from UNICEF. And then start stepping still, not really stepping, stopping as an organization, but analyzing, monitoring, adapting programming, and then going back into the field where schools reopen or where schools remain closed, continuing the program to start mitigating the, uh, the impacts of COVID-19. I see some very interesting parallels with the, uh, the actions also undertaken by, by UNICEF to, stop mit to start mitigating the negative impacts of COVID on, uh, on breastfeeding and young in well, infant and young child feeding. Um, so those are in fact two immediate measures we discussed now with WFP and UNICEF. We'd like to continue our presentation now with IDLO, Julia, uh, who will look a little bit more at the uh, legal side of, uh, of the issue. Julia, you have uh, the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Sineke. I'm trying to share my screen. Okay. Great. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can see it. Great. Okay. You may yes. want to use the uh, yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I am. Uh, I am using the uh, this word mode. Okay. Great. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning. Uh, today, I will present to you an initiative that IDLO has been developing in collaboration with FAO to contribute to the response to the food crisis during COVID-19, and in particular, to increase the understanding amongst relevant stakeholders of the challenges to access to food in emergency and recovery situations and of potential policy and legal solutions. As you all know, emergency measures to protect public health are starting to have adverse impacts on food security and nutrition. Restrictions to freedom of movement are reducing physical access to food due to constrained access to markets and limitations to public and private transport. Lockdowns and curfews are limiting the movement of goods and labor across the food production and distribution chain disrupting food supply system and creating the risk of price increases. This is likely uh, to be intensified by the current economic downturn and consequent loss of income, both at the global and national level, which is likely to reduce households' purchasing power and further increase malnutrition. Rule of law and human rights-based approaches provide solid frameworks for announcing sustainable and healthy diets in the context of COVID-19 response. 
In fact, the rule of law is essential to ensure that emergency laws and regulations are aligned with international human rights standards, and it is key for emergency laws and regulations to be based on a thorough understanding of contextual needs and to pay close attention to their impact on nutrition, particularly for the most vulnerable groups. So, through, through this project uh, intervention, what we would like to do is actually bringing together the right to food and the right to health as two sides of the same coin, in line with the evolving approach from food access to sustainable and healthy diets and Agenda 2030. The, the project is a pilot effort um, designed in a manner that allows uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to, uh, that allows for quick scaling up um, and will initially target two countries, Honduras and Uganda. Malnutrition in these two countries has in fact increased significantly in the context of, of COVID-19 and both countries have made political commitments to announcing food security and access to food. The project will employ a phased approach focusing first on assessing the impact of national emergency laws and regulations on access to food, with special focus on vulnerable groups, women and girls. The assessment will be informed by two complementary activities, a desk-based global review and a participatory assessment. Using the findings of these processes, uh, the project will develop specific and tailored briefs and guidance documents to support access to food for the most vulnerable in times of emergency. And another component of the project will also provide some technical support for convening online platforms to serve as feedback mechanisms for relevant stakeholders on the status of access to food and food security for vulnerable groups, women and girls. So, it is worthwhile mentioning uh, that we foresee the involvement of national human rights and ombuds institutions also in the development of these online platforms in order to facilitate also their monitoring functions. So, last point uh, that however is a key aspect of, uh, of the project intervention is participation. In fact, to ensure participation of all relevant stakeholders, consultations will be carried out in all phases of the project involving state institutions such as judicial bodies, relevant ministries, members of the parliament, civil society organizations, national human rights institutions, and development partners. This initiative is self-funded by IDLO. And, uh, is, um, and is likely to start uh, within, uh, within the next uh, couple of months. So, uh, I was very, very brief, and this is just a quick overview because I wanted to stay in the five minutes time, but I am of course available for, for any questions or additional information you might need. So, thank you. Over. Thank you, Julia. Thank you so much. And indeed you, you hit the five minutes dot exactly so very well well done and i really appreciated your presentation again bringing in an additional perspective the human rights based approach and i'd like to specifically thank you for for highlighting that shift we have seen in the food security world as to say or community shifting from food availability to food access, access to food, and now really having attention for sustainable, healthy diets. You cannot de-link the two, especially not in the context of the 2030 Agenda. Uh, and of course, the indivisibility of the right to food and the right to health and all other human rights, as well as, as, well as the element of, of participation. Thank you so much. And I'd like to move on now to the last speaker, WHO, uh, Melanie, I think you're online. I saw you uh, earlier this afternoon, at least. Yep, in I'm this here. List. Ah, perfect, here you are. Uh, the floor is yours. Just trying to share my slides. How is that? Can everybody see my slides? Yes, I can see it, thank you. Great. Okay, so um, my name is Melanie Cowan and I am uh, from the NCD department and specifically the team working on surveillance monitoring and reporting for NCDs. And we were invited to present here a little bit of our work 
from uh, the last few months where we did a review of COVID preparedness and response plans. And we were specifically looking at uh, NCDs, they had some content on NCDs in these plans. Um, and just to provide a little bit of background, our department ran uh, a rapid assessment or pulse survey back in May uh, across all member states to assess the impact of, um, of the pandemic on NCD resources. And as part of that exercise, we collected a number of these plans and we also asked countries a little bit about their content. And then this came out as kind of a follow on exercise to that survey, just, to, just as a little bit of background. So our actual um, review, as I've mentioned, is really just to access to what extent um, NCDs are covered in these plans. And then there was something tied into this survey that I mentioned that we also wanted to do this as kind of a means to validate uh, the, um, the responses that we received back from countries on the content of their CPRPs specifically um, whether or not um, NCDs get a mention in the list of essential health services in these documents or not. We also wanted to look to see about any guidelines, if there, first of all, if there are any guidelines on comorbidity reporting and whether or not NCDs get a mention there as well. And then there was a fairly extensive just keyword search where we thought we might just do one last try to see if there's any NCD related terms, but we ended up expanding this to include uh, some terms suggested by colleagues in other departments and notably outside of NCD's um, colleagues from the Health and Migration Department as well. The documents reviewed came not only actually from our survey, but also from the Essential Health Services uh, rapid assessment that they ran just after our survey in June, it was a similarly structured survey of all member states in which countries were also asked to submit their CPRPs. And then we also received additional CPRPs through colleagues in um, the health services resilience team in the um, in another department on uh, on health services, and they were doing another review of these documents, kind of much broader review on essential health services content of these documents, um, and they flagged. Um, documents for us that might specifically be of interest to our review. So they, they were helpful in providing kind of an additional 30, 40 documents for our review. We developed a set of uh, questions that we would be looking for, um, looking for inside these documents um, based on the guidelines specifically on NCDs and the um, essential health services documents uh, for CPRPs that came out over the summer. And then that document, this questionnaire that we devised was translated into Excel and we passed this around to a group of, a small group of reviewers, um, mostly at headquarters, who completed this um, as they went through document by document, um, not just ticking boxes, but also taking some notes on terms of what specific content was there. So in all, uh, we actually had over 200 documents to review and about 121 of them were of interest to us. Uh, and those came from 87 uh, member states. And here you can see the distribution across different regions and approximately what percentage of member states in each region were included in this review. So we have 87 countries, 121 documents across all six regions. And I've cut this down significantly from our much larger set of slides on the results, but just to give a few highlights, and then I will make a specific note of some nutrition related items. Um, the documents, um, only 39 countries um, included some mention of essential health services um, inside. So that was um, just under half of all the countries uh, documents that we reviewed. But for us on the plus side, um, most of those that include that give some mention of essential health services do make a mention specifically of non-communicable diseases. And we were able to validate the responses of just 67 countries um, from our survey. So specifically, we either um, had documents for these or um, these countries had said no, we were pretty, and we received additional documents. Um, and we're able to verify that, yep, indeed, NCDs wasn't there. So of those 67, 
um, countries. Um, there was fairly good alignment. Um, it was just over two thirds um, aligned with what they had told us. And basically for the remaining third, they were all being a bit overly positive saying, yeah, NCDs is there. And when we go and we look, we can't find it. Um, and then the uh, long set of questions we had on the continuum of care for NCDs, um, 58 of the 87 countries that whose documents we reviewed had absolutely none of these items whatsoever. And of the remaining 29, um, at most they had about five of the 18 items that we were looking for. Many of them just had one or two. So there really was, there was not a lot of content there. And for our keyword search, this was a fairly long list of keywords uh, that we included that we was just, as I said, one last look to see if we may have missed anything. And here I'm just giving out of the 87 countries whose documents we looked at, how many in how many countries documents did this keyword pop up? And not surprisingly, some of the broader ones just on NCDs or on the specific diseases, namely diabetes and cancer came up uh, most often. Some of the specific NCD risk factors were not mentioned so often, including healthy diet. Um, but we were specifically asked by our colleagues in nutrition to look for micronutrient, uh, malnutrition, and breastfeeding as, some, as keywords. And that did actually come up in 16 out of the 87 documents that we reviewed. And what we have done now is we've shared um, our massive spreadsheet where we've got every single document and it's noted which document um, has which keyword. And uh, we've shared these with all these uh, departments. So we're hoping that this will now be of use for these departments to have a more careful look at these CPRPs and see exactly the quality, the degree of the content on these various issues. So just in summary for for us in NCDs, um, they're not very well <laughs> covered in these, in these plans, uh, or if they are, there's very, very little detail. Um, essential health services are mentioned almost in almost half the country's documents that we uh, reviewed. Um, and they usually do mention NCDs, uh, not in ex extensive detail, but they at least get a passing mention. Uh, where we were able to validate our responses to our survey um, about the content of the CPRPs, um, we had about two thirds uh, in agreement, which is not too bad. Um, comorbidity guidelines were almost non-existent, very, very rare, to, <laughs> rarely did we see these in the documents. And uh, as I just mentioned, the keyword search showed that while specific NCD risk factors did not get much of a mention, um, some of the nutrition related items notably, as well as the migration related items, rehabilitation and disability, all got, uh, were all more frequently mentioned. So I hope that gives you a, a little bit of an, of an overview on the work that's been done. Thanks. Yes, thanks Melanie. It, it certainly does give a very interesting overview. So many lessons to be taken from this uh, this study this overview i really i really like to uh, to listen to it and in fact i'm curious i would like to to read the the study in fact um, it it is telling that ncd is not really coming out very clearly it's not covered too much in in the plans and if 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 it is it's with little detail but it is comforting maybe to this group that when it is there that at least nutrition comes out a bit uh, because we started off this afternoon by stating that nutrition and diet related factors are quite important factors in uh, in comorbidity we, uh, when you look at, uh, with, at COVID. So yeah, positive and not so positive, I would, uh, I would say. But I realize we have now reached uh, five past five and I, I know I said 10 past five that we would stop, but I really would like to give a little bit of opportunity for Q&A if people are still still have the energy, either in the chat or you can raise your hand. Maybe, maybe we can take another five minutes or so. Uh, I'm not sure if there's anyone who would like to make uh, ask a question or make a comment. Yes, Pineki, this is Miriam. 
So a big, big thank you to you and to all the speakers. All the presentations are really excellent. I was very pleased to see everything. So one of my recommendations, so I'm sure that we're already thinking of this, is how do we inform the design of the next COVID-19 plans? You know, it's not surprising initially they didn't focus on essential health services because the house was on fire and they need to extinguish the fire. <laughs> But now we have the next round. They're, the countries are constantly updating. They're realizing that the impact on essential health services is, you know, is quite substantial in many contexts. So I think what's really important is the advice that we give them on how to look at who you target in terms of comorbidities. I think that message is coming out and how do you protect essential health services? So, we need to be sort of forward looking, but thank you again for sharing this and for everyone that contributed. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Miriam, for your uh, kind words, but also for your very valid question. And in fact, I was thinking about that same question when I tried to summarize uh, Melanie's presentation. And I, I do believe we have quite some substantial knowledge in this group, uh, not just the presentations we did just now, the double duty actions, uh, the several measures we can take regarding breastfeeding, school food and nutrition, uh, even legal measures, but also the ones we already identified in, in our joint advocacy piece um, and that we did not have the time to go into much detail this afternoon. But I, I agree very much with you that we need to take a little bit more time possibly maybe our nutrition technical working group could do that in a next meeting to start thinking how can we advocate better um, for inclusion of, of these essential um, yeah ncd actions but also nutrition actions in uh, in the response plans country response plans. so so thanks very good comments uh, any anyone else Let me check if I can see hands or otherwise you just take the floor. I don't see any hands. I'll just give it one or two seconds. I don't see anything in the chat. Nope. Okay. Hi, I think Hi, it's... Shineke. Yeah, uh, Chizuru, is, please come yeah. in. Could I just ask a question to um, UNICEF colleague? It was, a very, it was a really interesting presentation. Thank you very, very much. But... Um, it was interesting to hear about the breastfeeding and, and a complement any feeding issues and a breast milk substitute uh, marketing issues. But I wonder if UNICEF has also monitored the use or the increasing use of follow-up formula as such in this context. Um, we talked about the, um, the complementary feeding and, and but we haven't really looked at this issue about follow-up formula particularly for the age groups or for, um, well, for the, for the older infants, um, the products are recognized as a breast milk substitute. However, for young children, the products, are, I mean, there is a debate that, um, I mean, for, as far as WHO is concerned, they are breast milk substitute, but they're not really, I mean, there have been quite a bit of a disagreement, but as such, in the, especially in this context, and, and especially given the fact that, that there has been some difficulties in obtaining the ingredients as such for preparing the healthy um, complementary feeding or complementary food, has the use of follow-up formula increased? I, I was just curious whether UNICEF colleagues were monitoring that part as well. Over to you. Thanks, Chisuri. Fatmata, would you like to uh, answer that question? We are working close, as you know, uh, we are in a number of countries across the world and uh, we are working closely uh, with our countries to strengthen policies, uh, regulations around uh, BMS, uh, including follow-up formula. And we recently re released a guideline on, on this, on follow-up formula, uh, which is uh, available. So in as much as, uh, you know, 
we do not directly like uh, monitor as a, a, well, I mean, at HQ level, but uh, we also encourage countries, you know, our partners and agencies to ensure that uh, monitoring and follow up, you know, actions are taken at country level and then uh, provide guidance uh, where we are needed, which we have already done. I can put uh, a, chat, a link to the chat box, uh, just, uh, you know, to highlight the recent uh, guidance that uh, we have put out there on follow up formula. Thank you, Nova. Great, thanks a lot. Any other question or comments? Also from the speakers, eh? if you would like to send one. Ah, I see one hand. Guan uh, Yun Liu. Yeah. Please. Th thank you very much. I will be uh, brief. Um, very grateful for all the uh, presentations uh, uh, from the speakers. This is a very interesting um, session. Um, I just want to congratulate you for the food summit. And um, but since we haven't uh, followed that uh, meeting, I want to understand whether this you know, growing word like whether tobacco ever comes into the debate or discussion there because we have the limited land and then you want to um, to grow the healthy and useful things. And um, but you, you don't need to answer me right now. And then maybe this is not because we are all in this one uh, task force. And then this one is a convention and we have a specific article uh, 17 on the alternative livelihood. The governments who sign this treaty has a duty and obligation to change to some other, um, you know, vegetables, whatever, and healthy uh, livelihood for those uh, growing tobacco. And uh, there might be something to add a bit of the argument. And also, I will be very happy uh, that to help you and, uh, you know, to reach out to these 180 parties. It's, part of the WHO convention. Thanks so much. I think that's a very interesting uh, comment and it flows directly from what Jamie also said that um, food systems provide livelihoods apart from food. Um, and I, I do hear you that tobacco producers are there and they earn a livelihood and we should help them, guide them towards producing something more healthy that is actually useful and nourishing people instead of destroying their, their health. But still that livelihood issue is a, uh, an important issue to take into account too. So I do not have an answer right now. Uh, and luckily you gave me the opportunity <laughs> not to answer immediately, unless anyone else in this group would like to answer. But I think it's, it's good. Let's, let's continue thinking about it and let's bring it into the food one way or the other in the food system summit. I, I really appreciate that comment. Anyone in the group who would like to answer that question or any other comments? Any of the speakers who would like to send us home with a closing message? If not, I'm just checking the chat and I'm checking hands. I think I will then try to close. I thank all the speakers for their very interesting and engaging um, presentations, really highlighting the importance of not just continuing the work we are doing in the area of, of food and nutrition, but also running faster in order to, to yeah, mitigate the impacts of the COVID-19 crisis on food and nutrition security. So that's that's one. I also heard some very interesting um, comments and questions from the speakers, but also from you, for ideas that we should take into account. Not in the least place, in the last place, um, uh, Miriam's comment about uh, so what's next? How do we ensure that NCD and nutrition are going to be taken into account by the country response plans? Um, so thank you all. Uh, I will stop now. I would like to wish you a very pleasant evening or a very pleasant rest of the day and a very good weekend. And I will be in touch 
uh, with some of you for uh, follow-up actions. Thank you so much and um, looking forward to a next session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.